welcome to the first episode of Sunny Irabo Live. I am Sunny Irabo. Every week, I will sit down with Africa's most influential leaders and change makers from diverse sectors. Together, we will explore the issues and prefer solutions to the continent's most pressing needs. You will find a range of conversations from politics to social life and more on SIL. This is not just another talk show. This is Sunny Irapo Live on News Central. Welcome. There are many great Africans who have flown the banner of the continent high. When we hear their names, we're very proud to say this is a son or daughter of the soil. My guest for this first episode of SIL is such a man. He is a first class honors graduate of agricultural economy and a PhD holder of the same discipline. He was once Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture before he became the president of the African Development Bank Group in 2015. I sat down with Dr. Adeshina to talk about a range of issues. After the break, we'll hear from Dr. Adeshina himself. Stay tuned. Welcome to Sunny Irabo Live. Well, today I have a very world phenomenon. I should say that because he's a man we've been looking from a distance, and from what we see, he's a man after our hearts. We're very proud of him. We are proudly Nigerian when we hear Dr. Akiumi Adishino. Well, for him, he's a world phenomenon because he's not just proudly Nigerian. He's also proudly the world leader. Welcome, sir. Thank you so thank very you much. Thank you for giving us some little time of yours, yeah, you know, because you, I sir. can see how busy you are. Thank you. Well, let me quickly look at you in terms of um, your background, mm. agricultural economist, mm. and now you're also a financier of sorts. How do you manage the two? Well, you know, it's very interesting because um, what I do as president of African Development Bank is help to accelerate Africa's development. And that Africa's development requires very pragmatic and very practical solutions. I don't, yeah. and not, I don't like anything that kind of <laughs> goes in the air. I like practical things that are on the ground. And I think, you know, my experience of being an agricultural economist, but also uh, worked globally in international agricultural research centers, um, interacted with people in policymakers and farmers on the field, rural areas, has allowed me to see real challenges and real uh, issues that people face. So as President of African Development Bank, I lead my team, I have a phenomenal team, to be sharply focused on actually addressing the myriad of problems, but always understanding that they are interlocked. And so there has to be uh, a systemic way in which I look at things. And so I think maybe my profession or my training as a cultural economist, where you have to look at bigger picture has helped me tremendously. Good. But then you look at the fact that the world leaders, African leaders especially, they don't go in tune with all the kind of strategic thinking that you, you are applying. I don't see them doing that. How does that discourage or encourage you? Well, in fact, actually, I, as you know, in my role, I interact and engage with several, in fact, literally every single president yeah. uh, on this continent. And I am always encouraged by the fact that they are committed to accelerating the development of their countries, of their people. There's, of course, myriads of challenges that, uh, that they have to, uh, 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 to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why at the African Development Bank, when I was elected first president in 2015, um, I, remember that. I, I, I asked myself that we've got to accelerate Africa's development. It's Africa's premier financial institution. And I'm grateful to all of our shareholders for that. But when I look at African Development Bank, I said the bank part, we know how to manage. A first rate financial institution. But the most important part is African development part. Mm -hmm. So it is that that I decided to focus on. And that's why we developed, I developed a vision. It's called High Fives. Yeah, it's high like five, you're yes. kind of greeting people. Mm -hmm. But it's a very powerful vision in the sense that it says there are five major things that we must do to fast track Africa's development. First, 
light up and power Africa, have universal access to electricity all across Africa. Well, that's very slow here, you know that. Oh, yeah, but it's not just Nigeria. We have challenges even in South Africa today, but I'll come back to that in the discussion. Mm -hmm. But what is not acceptable is not having universal access to electricity. Mm -hmm. Second one is to feed Africa, um, being able to have able to feed ourselves, because I believe that you can't have development with pride unless you can feed yourself, mm -hmm. feed your people. Mm -hmm. Third is to industrialize Africa so that we can actually create huge amount of jobs and become more competitive in global economy. The fourth one is to integrate Africa. You've got 54 uh, countries in Africa. That's a huge market. You've got to take advantage of that. We've got to be able to connect, increase connectivity, be able to, be able to integrate financial markets in those countries. We have to be able to become an industrial manufacturing zone so that we can actually thrive and prosper. And finally is the fifth one, which I really love, which is to improve the quality of life of the people of Africa. And that really means improving health access, education, jobs for young people, water and sanitation. So those are the things that I see. And I just want to say that for every country in Africa, those high fives have now been included as the main drivers of their economy. That's a huge progress for us. And, and why that is important is that United Nations Development Program did an independent mm -hmm. assessment yeah. of those high fights. And you know what it came up with? That if Africa achieves those high fights, it would have achieved 90% of the Sustainable Development Goals mm -hmm. and 90% of Agenda 63, which is the 2063, which is the Africa we want. So the African presidents are very committed to that, and I am relentless in helping them to achieve them. Why am I not accepting what you're saying about the African leadership? Mm. They're not exactly following the same, the spirit that you are Im imbibing. They don't, they don't follow it. Not in their leadership, not in the way they deal with the people that, uh, you know, that they, they govern. I'm talking of the African leaders Specifically, let me just say Nigeria, South Africa, uh, Tanzania. Well, Tanzania is okay. Well, let me give you two examples. Yes. Right, because I have a lot of faith and confidence in African leadership. Um, you know, two great examples. You know, you're talking of food. Yeah. You know, in January of last year, when the war, um, because as a result of the war between Russia and Ukraine, yeah. the price of food just went up globally. Heavy. Global inflation. Yeah. The price of wheat and the price of maize. And I asked myself the question, you know, um, you know, in fact, I was asked to testify before the U.S. Um, Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling the U.S. Senators that, as far as I'm concerned, the solution to this is not about begging for food or giving food away to Africa. The solution is for Africa to have a bowl in hand, not to beg, but to put seed in those bowls and plant its own mm -hmm. seed and grow its own food, mm -hmm. right? And, and so I was amazed that we were depending almost 90% for wheat and maize on Russia and Ukraine. It didn't make sense. Yeah. And so talking about African leaders, I decided to get together with the then chair of the African Union Commission, uh, African Union, President Macky Sall, his excellent President Macky Sall of Senegal. Mm -hmm. And we decided to have with the African Union Commission um, a Feed Africa Summit. Well, you know what happened? This Feed Africa Summit had in attendance 34 heads of state and government, not represented, Physically, President, yeah, President Buhari was there mm. uh, at that time. And we had the President of Ireland who came with his wife for us, with, uh, with us for four days. And you know what? We, the presidents did not give speeches because I said, no, we're not going to have speeches. We're going to mm -hmm. speak from our heart okay. and deal with the issue. They did not come with speeches. And we put them into boardrooms in which we had to think about with other partners, private sector de you know, development partners, um, what's the plan that will make your country self-sufficient in food. So this not, was like a workshop? No, it wasn't a workshop. It was an investment board. Forum. Yes, okay. Right. Okay. Where the issue is, we're not going to be around this thing talking forever. You mm -hmm. know, we've got to be able to feed ourselves in five years. So each country, we work together with FAO and several other partners to develop what's called Food and Agriculture Delivery Compact. Now, I remember asking the president of Syria alone, Mm -hmm. They just finished a panel at 3.20, almost 3.30. And it was time, they haven't had lunch yet. And I said, Mr. President, it's either we go into the investment boardrooms or uh, you guys go have lunch. Oh, you know what he told me? He said, look, we would rather give up our lunch 
to mm -hmm. go into those investment boardrooms and figure out how we are going to feed our people. people. If that's not commitment, what is commitment? <laughs> they stayed in those boardrooms, I'm mm -hmm. telling you. Mm -hmm. Many of them till 11 p.m. When have we ever seen that in Africa? A head of state staying since morning in investment boardrooms till 11 p.m. President Makisal offered a state dinner for the heads of state. He didn't have many takers. They were still in the investment boardrooms. That is commitment. And yeah. I, on our side, we also delivered because we were able to work with global leaders, global institutions, and we mobilized within six weeks. By the time the summit ended in three days, we had mobilized $30 billion to implement what they decided. And in six weeks, we had mobilized $72 billion. So I see that as a tremendous amount of commitment. And so that's what I'm saying, that ideas, it doesn't matter how good they are. Mm -hmm. You need good policies, but you need leaders to carry them. And I'm proud of what they did. And I'm happy to hear that too, because um if I look at how Nigeria is moving, well, I keep coming back to Nigeria, okay. please forgive me. Nigeria is 20, 200 million plus of the whole continent of Africa. That's almost a fifth, if you ask me. And that alone means that we have to set the pace, but we are not able to do that. Therefore, so what do we do? We look at a situation where African leadership has to not wait for Nigeria, but for other African countries. And you being a Nigerian in ADB, it encourages many of us. Can you therefore talk to them and they listen to you, African leaders? Oh, absolutely, they listen to me. Um, you know, there's not a single president in, on this continent that I don't talk to directly. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my job is more than just providing financing. My job is providing advice, okay. providing unfettered, you know, ideas in an unfettered way, you know, to help the president succeed. You know, I have a fundamental way of working as president of African Development Bank, and it's this. The word of a king, let me say, mm. can never fall to the ground, no. So when leaders say they want to do something, my job, my duty, my responsibility is to help them to succeed True. in doing that. And that is what we do every single day. Are the African, as president uh, of the African Development Bank. Even when you take a look at the case of Nigeria that you mentioned, you know, I came here to see President Bola Chidumbo. He was very generous to meet with me about, you know, on, actually precisely on the 14th uh, mm -hmm. of February um, of this year, you know, and, um, you know, we are strongly supportive of, uh, of him and of his government. You know, our portfolio as African Development Bank here is $4.6 billion. And this year, we expect to go to our board of directors for approvals of various operations, worth $1.76 billion. And as part of that, will be a billion dollars in two tranches that we are negotiating with the Minister of Finance while they are doing, that would provide them with direct budget support to help deal with some of the fiscal challenges that the country um, is, is, is facing. And so, I guess, you know, I'm not one of those leaders I don't criticize. Mm. I only try and find solutions that help. Absolutely, I love that. I, say, I give that to you. <laughs> it's very obvious for what you're telling us now. I'm critical because of my background and I'm seeing things. I understand. The one that is really very glaring now is the Naira to the dollar. It had never been so bad. Mm. And from ADB, you are a financier, I called you that at the beginning, and then of course, you're seeing what is happening. Maybe you're also seeing what is not happening. Maybe that's why you're talking to us the way you are. But agriculture is dying mm. in Nigeria. You were Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria just two terms ago or something like that. What do you think we should, we should do now? No, it's, it's, it sadly breaks my heart to, to see the situation uh, with regard to food uh, in the country. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why it should be that way. You know, um, I think the, the lessons to learn from that is the importance of consistency of policy. If you want to build a skyscraper, you can't always be breaking up your foundations every single day. Mm. You have to build and build and build. Assuming that those foundations are very, very good foundations. Mm. And I think we set excellent foundations. I mean, when I was minister, we had uh, an electronic wallet system that 
actually allowed farmers across this country to get access to seed and fertilizers mm -hmm. via their mobile phones in terms of electronic voucher. It was the first ever done in the world, actually. Right? Afghanistan is following your yeah, footsteps already. many others, actually, uh -huh. now all across Africa. And we were able to do 15 million farmers, and that's what allowed Nigeria to produce a lot of food. I do think that they need to go back to that. Um, because if you go to a supermarket or a, a, a hospital and you're asking uh, your doctor to recommend something for you, medications, and they do, and you go to a pharmacy, uh, but the patient can't get access uh, to, the, uh, to the medication, uh, what does it matter? It doesn't matter how smart your doctor is. The patient is going to be sick or die. Hmm. And so the access to that is fundamental. What it means we must put those farmers at the heart of every single thing. Right. Secondly, is to make sure that agriculture itself is built in such a way that it's a business. And when I was minister, I would, we were really working for it to be a business, you know. And so, which means that support entire value chain, support private sector, support the banking industry to reduce the, uh, the risk of lending and, and, and lower interest rates uh, for people, you know. I mean, uh, I, I, you know, I am very supportive and I'm, I commend, let me say, uh, the central bank governor for all of what they are doing um, in terms of taming inflation. But when it comes to this particular issue hmm. of food, it's not necessarily your monetary policy that's going to deal with that. It is a structural issue. We just have to produce more food. The, 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 the consumer price index, 65% or 70% of it, is the price of food. So if you keep the price of food down by actually producing a lot more food, then you are going to be able to tame this inflation. And so, and that's why for us at African Development Bank, again, you know, we are strongly supporting Nigeria. You know, as I speak to you today, we are implementing in Nigeria an emergency food production program. Thank you. $134 million. <laughs> Ooh. It's not what we plan to do, it's what we are doing. Hmm. You know, I had my team in this country for the last several weeks. They're all across the north and other parts of the country. For the dry season, which is what we were doing, we already planted 118,000 hectares of heat tolerant wheat varieties. Secondly, by March, we are going to support the cultivation of 150,000 hectares of rice. And by the rainy season, we start May or so, you know, we're going to support Nigeria to produce, to, to cultivate 300,000 hectares of rice, 300,000 hectares of maize. 150,000 hectares of cassava and 50,000 hectares of soybean. That means that in a month's time, by this month, Nigeria should get an additional 1 million metric tons of, of wheat and, um, and, and before November, an additional 4 million. So all I'm saying is that we've got to do more. There's no reason why. Of course, we have to control insecurity because that insecurity is a major challenge. Okay, just before we go, You've given us beautiful you know, analogies on the way to go, and I'm happy about that. Congratulations for the um, Abafemi Award, Award oh, for thank Leadership. You. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we know you are the kind of leader we all want, mm. all right? How do we tackle insecurity? Please, just maybe 30 seconds, if you can, just give me. Because without, without security, these things will not exactly work. Yes. I'm sorry. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, because without security, there's nothing you can do, right? I think tackling security um, needs to kind of understand the drivers of insecurity. Um, because so that it's not just you can buy all the guns you want and you can shoot all you want. But if the drivers of it are not dealt with, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you have a, an animal that's slaughtered, you know, and the blood is on the ground, and you have flies all over it, and you tick um, a fly swat, and you keep swatting it, well, you're gonna be there all day, mm -hmm. as long as the blood is there. But if you take the animal out, and you, which is the, the, the driver of it, that mm -hmm. brings all the things. So what I'm saying by that is simple, is that some of the structural drivers is extreme poverty. The poverty is too high, mm. you know. And it's, it's, I'm not blaming any government. I, it's not my style, but the reality is the reality. When you are a medical doctor, you go and they ask you to take a scan. A scan don't lie. Scans, scans don't lie. It tells you exactly how you mm -hmm. are. So we've got to be able to look at ourselves and say, what exactly is the scanning telling us? It's telling us that a extreme poverty, structurally, is in the country. And secondly, is the high level of unemployment 
among young people, both urban and rural areas. Mm. That's a disaster in the making. And third, which is not caused by Nigeria, is the external, uh, external issue in terms of climate change and environmental degradation. You take the whole of the Lake Chad Basin, for example, you should take care of you know, millions of people. In that region. Yeah, but it's all dried up, and therefore you have all of these challenges. So all I'm trying to say is that we need to do, continue to do a lot of work to create more jobs, skill up our young people, give them more opportunities. And that's why we are the African Development Bank. Uh, started something called the um, uh, Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks that are going to be new financial institutions that will provide financing for the young people. I don't believe in so-called youth empowerment programs. Mm -hmm. It works for those that are doing it, not for the young people. The young people don't need that kind of empowerment. They need investment. Investment in their ideas, their creativity, their, their entrepreneurship with money. Investment capital in them to turn those into mega businesses. And that's why you know, we're going to be set, you know, working with the government in Nigeria to set up the Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Bank in Nigeria. Um, this year, you know, it's going to go to our board of directors. Secondly, is to also make sure that we deal with the issue of, of poverty. You know, and dealing with poverty means that you've got to do the two ends. One is the rural poverty. The way you deal with that is that you have to turn agriculture, which is their main source of livelihood, for 70 percent of the population into a wealth creating sector, a real wealth creating sector. That is how all that is going to be dealt with. Of course in the urban areas it has to be a lot more financing for small businesses. You know, our economy is run by small businesses. And so then for tackling the issue of power is important. Water and sanitation is very important. But also providing access to affordable financing to run that economy is very important. So I and I think fixing infrastructure bottlenecks, a lot has been done. You know, but more still needs to be done uh, to connect people, to provide access to, uh, to markets for people, digital infrastructure and all of these things. It's a lot you know, that faces uh, a government every single day. Um, but you know, I, I, as, um, as a Nigerian, I, um, I, I, I see the, the issues. We're doing the best we can. But we need to particularly correct one thing. What is that? And that thing we need to correct is the way in which we are handling forex issues. Hmm. You see, if you have a funnel, it's like this. What you're doing is we're squeezing the bottom of the funnel mm -hmm. for whatever can come out of it. It's a redistributive model. You can never win a game when you're playing defense. You win a game by playing offense. And the offense is to have an export-oriented industrial manufacturing stance that allows Nigeria to have the industrial platforms that it can become a major exporter of goods and services, value added. Hmm. That will make sure that the funnel is having a lot of things coming into it. That is how the economy will be built in a sustainable way in the long run. And because if you run a distributive economy, in which a limited amount of foreign exchange over time has been used just to shore up the Naira, what that does for you is basically it makes your imports cheaper. Yeah. And it makes your import cheaper, it actually uh, affects your domestic competitiveness of your domestic sectors you're trying to go. Secondly, is that it also makes that of a valued exchange that you have, makes the export of your non oil sector non-competitive because those things are not traded in dollars, they are traded in in local currency equivalents that, that uh, uh, for, with other countries. And thirdly, is the fact it just basically, you know, means that you are, it's like you have a flood that's coming and you, you put your hand <laughs> there. Eventually that water, <laughs> water will carry you and your hand away because <laughs> you cannot continue that. And I think that I want to commend the efforts being made. It's a very tough issue being made. Uh, I think the president in Nigeria, President Bolami Chinumbu, faces a tough challenge in all these macroeconomic and fiscal issues. But I do feel that there are certain things we can man manage in the, in the, in the short term, hmm. and we'll do our best in the short term. But you see, a very good doctor will always tell you, don't come back the same. So fix the long-term structural issues. And I think that's where I really think we need to be focused on. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And I'm so glad you were able to even give enough within such a short time. Thank you. So the president of the African Development Bank Group, 
Dr. Adeumi Adeshina. Akiumi. Akiumi. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Akiumi Adeshina. I must not make that mistake. Again. People like to call me Adeumi, I guess. <laughs> I get used to it too. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, sir. I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Welcome back. In my conversation with Dr. Akiumi Adeshina, we discussed some of Africa's critical economic challenges. Key points included the need to achieve the high five objectives, which include light up and power Africa, feed Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life for the people of Africa. Interesting key points, I must say. Finally, additional emphasize the significance of agriculture, power, and financing issues for urban businesses. Interesting to note that this gentleman recently bagged the Awolo Award Prize for Leadership Award. He has made history as a true son of the soil, basking in the euphoria of pride with past winners of the prestigious award, such as Nobel laureate Wale Shoinka, former South African President Thabo Mbeki, and legal luminary Are Afe Babalola. No doubt, this award is reserved for the best on the continent. Hardworking, forward-looking, diligent, brilliant, and patriotic. At the awards ceremony, there were some major take-homes for me, for you, for Nigerians, and the whole continent. It will be a disservice if I do not share with you an excerpt of these conversations. The Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Kashim Shetima, was at the event. He shared about the legacy of Chief Obafemi Awolowo and why we must borrow from his wisdom. Chief Obafemi Awolo's life also provides a compelling narrative for every student of leadership, an inspiration that continues to resonate across our community, our nation, and the global stage. Therefore, I am honored to be invited to yet another avenue to reassure ourselves of his essence. To comprehend Chief Awolo's teachings, we must compound the obscured reality of leadership. The initial trial of every leader lies in overcoming the conspiracies of mischief makers, skeptics, and saboteurs. Or the great Sarge from Ikeni, his enduring impact persists despite the vigilance efforts. Time shifts through biases and lies, and through hidden agendas and propaganda. Time delivers to us the naked truth that defines the top decisions and sacrifices every sincere leader must make to create a difference. But in all we do, we must always find strength in the belief of those who trust the process, those who give us the benefit of the doubt. There is no greater honor than the privilege to lead one's people. And assuming a position of leadership during times of turbulence is the ultimate test of our mettle as leaders. It is in these moments of uncertainty that true character and capability come to the forefront. While the immediate judgment may be rendered by the people we either impress or displease, the long-term budget is carved by time, the passage of time. In his time, if our law was called both from within and outside his political party, he faced a hostile opposition and was pushed hard to the extent of finding himself behind bars a victim of his ambition to make a difference. With time, even his harshest critics came to realize the futility of undermining him. He stood out, even in death, because of his refusal to compromise his convictions. He fought until his very last days in defense of democracy in Nigeria, and these are the examples that make him a hero of the nation. Today we are here to celebrate a maverick change maker who has not only flown our flag all over the world, 
but has dazzled the world with the nobility of his thoughts, indispensability of his ideas, and dynamism of his actions. Today, we gather to honor a man who has carved his path in one of the most challenging offices to lead, Dr. Akimomi Ayodeji Adishina. Like Chief Aulo, our honoree today has exemplified the values that have shaped the course of history at all the institutions he has headed, all the offices, all the offices he occupied. I am therefore thrilled that the Obafemi Aulo Leadership Prize is set out to honor a prophet in his home today. This is the power of standing for one's convictions and serving humanity fairly. But it is not just time that will pierce through the pleading shadows of skepticism and propaganda endured in the service of the people. Rather, it is the resolve of the people to stand for honesty and justice, even when they do so alone, and even when they are outnumbered. In celebrating Dr. Adishina's achievements, we are not merely acknowledging a leader. We are recognizing a role model and mentor who paves the way for current and future generations. His journey, his journey from the esteemed institution now named after Chief Aulo attests to the transformative power of looking ahead in preparing to hit the runway of history. His ability to navigate the complexities of his role at the African Development Bank showcases not only his competence, but also his resilience in the face of challenges. Once again, on behalf of my principal, President Bola Ahmed Chinibu, ECFR, and on behalf of the good people of Nigeria, I extend my heartfelt congratulations to our dear brother, my friend, and my brother, Dr. A. 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 Vice President Shetima's address was both eloquent and profound as he paid homage to the enduring legacy of leaders who have shaped Nigeria's history. His recognition of Abafemi Awolowo's resilience in the face of adversity serves as a reminder of the challenges faced by visionaries thriving to make a difference. In praising Awolowo as a national hero, Shetima underscored the significance of bold leadership in driving progress. Furthermore, Shetima's heartfelt tribute to Dr. Akumi Adeshino resonated deeply with the audience, acknowledging Adeshino's outstanding contribution to African development. Through his words, Shetima not only honored Adeshino's achievements, but also conveyed the collective pride of the Nigerian people in his success. There are more enriching insights from the distinguished voices present. These include Emeka Anyoku, former Commonwealth Secretary General, and Sakle Wok Zude, President of Ethiopia. Their perspectives further illuminated a proposed path for our leaders on the continent, drawing inspiration from Awaisim. First, he showed that leadership must be based on the possession of a personal philosophy which the leader would persuade his or her colleagues to adopt and implement. Chief Awarawo's writings in his several books and many pronouncements were clearly the basis of his remarkable performance as the premier of the then Western region. Second, Chief Awolowo showed, a showed that a leader should actively care for the welfare and security of the people that he or she is privileged to lead. An example of this was his introduction of free primary education and agricultural reforms that laudably impacted the lives of the young people and the cocoa farmers 
in Western region. Third, Chief Awolowo demonstrated that a leader must possess undoubted integrity and a sense of accountability to his or her people. And fourthly, Chief Obafemi Awolowo believed that a leader must show example of self-discipline and personal organizational capacity in the management of public affairs. And fifthly, Chief Awolowo demonstrated that a leader in a country must be a true patriot and nationalist whose commitment to promoting the interests of all parts of the country must be beyond question. In a pluralistic country such as Nigeria, with long established different ethnic groups, Chief Obafemi Awolowo showed us how to become a true patriot. He was conscious of his roots as a Yoruba man, but he demonstrated his unquestionable patriotism and nationalism as leader of the opposition in Nigeria's post-independence parliament and in his countrywide electoral campaign for the presidency of the country. Ameka Anyoko's speech highlighted essential qualities of leadership. His emphasis on a leader's responsibility to actively care for the welfare of their people resonates deeply, underscoring the importance of servant leadership. Anyoko's tribute to Awolowo's pioneering efforts in education and agriculture reflects the transformative impact of visionary policies on young generations. Furthermore, his emphasis on integrity, self-discipline, patriotism, and nationalism as indispensable traits of leadership provides valuable insights into the essence of effective governance. Up next, let's look at the perspective that Saleh Zode, president of Ethiopia, brought to the discussion on leadership and progress in Africa. That comes up after the break. Saleh Wok Zude emphasized the significance of recognizing and honoring exemplary leadership, echoing the sentiments expressed by Chief Obafemi Awolowo. Her emphasis on leading by example and the potential of fostering peace, security, and development in Africa reflects a shared vision for the continent's progress. It's best heard from her. It is important to recognize and celebrate those, who, oh, those whose work has had an impact on the many lives they have touched. It shows that honoring a person who deserves it's not a forgotten value, that recognition is in fact a positive value. Those who have been successful prove their achievements need indeed to be honored because great leaders are not just made but discovered because they have done real things visible tangible me measurable leading is not an easy task 
such leaders need to be lifted up in public. As Chief Obafemi Awolowo said, and I quote, if political leaders led by example, the people would follow suit, end of quote. We have a good opportunity now to fast track peace, security, and development on our continent. For a peaceful and developed continent, it's indeed time, long overdue, to put our acts together. Such leaders should and would be role models, mentors for others to look up to. We are gathered here to celebrate and honor such a person. The 2024 laureate of the Awolo Prize for Leadership, who went through a careful, detailed, and rigorous screening process. The president of the African Development Bank, Dr. Akinyumi Adeshina. I join those who have praised this amazing son of Africa. Our presence here is a testimony of the respect and high esteem that Dr. Adeshina is held in our countries and indeed across the continent. Because as I said earlier, inspirational leader, a leader who is selfless, highly committed, a visionary, and who, one who is driven in uh, the lives of millions of people with tenacity and with relentless pursuit of excellence. Provision of innovative solution is uh, also what characterizes Dr. Adeshina. Today, it's you that we are honoring and who fulfill all what I have said. You have laid the institution, the African Development Bank, to global heights and provided incredible visibility for what today is a globally recognized and trusted institution. I think we will all agree that the African Development Bank has been transformed into a truly global financial institution. To name some of the achievements, of the many achievements, ADB was ranked the best multilateral development bank in the world by global finance. It has been also ranked the most transparent financial institution in the world by Publish What You Fund. You would agree that it's a great testament of Dr. Adeshina's remarkable leadership driven by transparency and accountability. I thank his exceptional teams he has put together. In Ethiopia, just to mention a few things, ADB is a brand name. It has been a long-standing and trusted partner since its creation, and we have great stories to tell. Since Dr. Adeshina took the presidency of the bank, through the support of the ADB, which provided us with access to heat-tolerant wheat varieties, Ethiopia, in spite of the many challenges, we have been, we have, has become uh, also a producer uh, of wheat, uh, leading to self-sufficiency in only four years. The area cultivated under heat-tolerant heat varieties in Ethiopia has expanded from 5,000 hectares in 2018 to over 1.2 million hectares in um, 2003. We need this hope and concrete action to showcase that Africa can become indeed self-sufficient in food. Dr. Adeshina's ability to easily connect with people, it has been said by the pre previous speakers, has helped drive developments in Africa because one needs a highly trusted and respected global leader to do that. We should also remember the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. As we reflect on the insights shared by esteemed speakers such as Emeka Nyoku, Vice President Kashim Shetima, 
and President Saleh Wokzode, it's evident that the path to Africa's prosperity lies in visionary leadership, dedication to service, and collaboration. Their words inspire us to work together towards a brighter future for all Africans. This also brings us back to the man of the hour. Dr. Akumi additional staring speech at the award ceremony resonated deeply with all of us. His acceptance of the award as a trophy of hope encapsulates the spirit needed to tackle the challenges we face. I still believe that we shall be who we were meant to be. Today I accept this prize as a trustee of hope for millions of our people. You bestow upon me this honor, this great honor, at a momentous period of great global challenges, from rising debt, climate change, fragilities, and vulnerabilities. Your honor is a call to do more amidst these challenges. So therefore, I celebrate but with measure. As I know with all humility that the work of making Nigeria great and by implication making Africa great is still in progress. It is my lifelong mission by the special grace of God to do all I can to improve the lives of all Africans. The wind of challenges may sometimes shift us away from our destined path, albeit momentarily, but we shall overcome our challenges. Nigeria must dream. Africa must dream. Yes, we may have challenges, so do other people around the world. Yet, all I see tells me that by God's grace, we will get there. We must start by unleashing our potential, our full potential, while managing our challenges. We must make poverty history in Nigeria. And we must make poverty history in Africa. We will not be known as the museum of poverty in the world. We must deliver a better Nigeria and a better Africa for this generation and for generations to come. Given the high level of poverty in Africa and in Nigeria and in other countries, what is needed are welfareist policies that exponentially expand opportunities for all, reduce inequalities, improve the quality of life of people. These must be anchored on public-centric policies and private sector wealth creation for all. Additional's call to do more amidst adversity inspires us to strive for greatness, not just for Nigeria, but for the entire African continent. As he emphasized, it is our collective responsibility to improve the lives of all Africans and to dream big. He further shared his vision for Africa's future and his strategies for driving progress. I'd like to focus on five areas. First, Rural economic transformation and food security. Second, healthcare security for all. Third, education for all. Fourth, access to affordable housing for all. And fifth, government accountability and fiscal decentralization for a true federalism. First, Nigeria must completely transform its rural economies to ensure food security for all. A better Africa must start with the transformation of our rural economies. And that is because 70% of our population live right there. Rural poverty today is extremely high. And at the heart of transforming rural economies is agriculture, the main source of their livelihoods. When agriculture moves away from being a way of life to a business, everything changes. Higher incomes, higher wages from agribusiness will support education and health and spur even greater job creation for millions of youths. As a young student 
who attended high school in a village. I remember when I went to the village school, the great school, but it wasn't a village. I went to Igbo Baptist High School, fantastic school. And I remember asking my father, why you went to Igbo College? Why did you send me to a village school? He looked at me and he said, I don't know what you are going to ever be in life. But if you live in a village and you understand the challenges of poor people, if God ever makes you anybody important in life, you will know exactly what to do. I witnessed in that school, in the village, the high correlation of agricultural performance with education. Several of my classmates, and many of them are here today, and thank you for coming, my classmates, were children of farmers. I noticed then that when agriculture season was good, they stayed in school. They performed well in school. But when the season was poor and agriculture did not perform, several of them dropped out of school or attended intermittently. Dr. Akiwumi Adishino's speech outlined five critical local areas for African development, ranging from rural economic transformation to government accountability. His emphasis on agriculture as the cornerstone of rural economic development struck a chord and that was a big take home for me and some of the dignitaries at the occasion. That wasn't all, my friends. His fascinating narrative about experiencing poverty firsthand underscores his commitment to understanding and solving societal challenges. While we advocate visionary leadership, it is worthy to note that Nigeria, the supposed giant of Africa, stands as a cornerstone for Africa's growth and development due to its significant population, vast economic potential driven by abundant resources and its role as a regional influencer. With its diverse culture and strategic location, Nigeria serves as an innovation hub and a gateway for international trade. Its stability and cooperation are essential for fostering peace and security in the region. As Nigeria continues to address internal challenges and capitalize on its strengths, it holds the key to driving progress and prosperity across the continent. On this note, I say thank you for joining me on Sunny Rabo Live on News Central. Stay tuned for more thought-provoking conversations and insights right here on SIL. I am Sonny Irabo.